Good evening, everybody. Look at me. It's RFM back in the studio. Hello, Mr. Real. How are you doing this evening? What's it feel like to be back in the saddle, RFM? I tell you, I just flew in from London and oh, my arms are so tired. They hurt, really. It's a things long are trip. Th things are heavier over there in London. Yes, by pounds. <laughs> uh, Do you have a good vacation? I had the most wonderful vacation of my entire life. Yeah. The last seven days. And I, I could regale you with stories about it for an hour, but I know you have something else planned. And okay. so I'll reserve that. I'm going to try and get some pictures together and maybe tell a few stories. I got to see uh, Ian McKellen playing Falstaff in Henry the Fourth, Parts 1 and 2. That was a, a long but very enjoyable afternoon. That was last Saturday. And then the Book of Mormon musical last Monday evening. And I, I heard that you had uh, an experience with Captain Nemo that was a little bleakly, you know? Oh, right, right, right. Ca yes, it was. It was quite <laughs> wonderful to see both of them in the flesh, as it yeah. were. Nemo and Peter Bleakley. Yes, yes, sir. In a two, two solid flesh. So we weren't sure if you would make it back in time. You sort of cut it kind of close, right? <laughs> it found a flesh. And uh, uh, so we prepared something sort of without you, gave you kind of the chance to, to change it up if you wanted, but uh, we're going to go ahead with what I've got planned here. And I hope folks uh, love it. You and I had a chance to talk about an hour ago. Uh, about what this would entail. And so I will put the slideshow up on the screen. And uh, <clears throat> there's two stories. I put them at the very end. I'll mention it when we get there. But there were two stories that I, I've been wanting to cover for a while. And one in particular, I've known pretty much since I joined the church. And I've always wanted to explore the story and tell it. And I had the chance to sort of look up all the, uh, the data on it, which isn't a bunch, uh, a few weeks ago. <clears throat> And so I, I knew it wouldn't be enough to make an entire episode around. So I was lucky enough to find another article that had uh, kind of rumors of impropriety, sexual impropriety by Joseph Smith uh, prior to 1835. And I took the instances in that several of these folks will be aware of, but there's a few new ones. And uh, I combined it with the two stories I wanted to tell about Martin Harris and Brigham Young which I think will be more fun uh, as we get to the end. So uh, any thoughts on the surface of this before we jump into it? No, I will be trying to mind my P's and Q's and not responding to any of these questions that are being put up on the screen that have nothing to do with tonight's show. Nothing, I tell you. This is about history, <clears throat> excuse me, history of the church and your show and your slides and your ideas, Mr. Real. All right, so here we go. The very first one is Josiah Stoll's daughters. Now, I'm going to say on the on the front end of this that I, don't, I, I have opinions about each of these. I think some of these stories are credible. I think some of them are interesting, and I think some of them don't have enough merit to them to warrant us uh, saying that they're true. So I want you to understand that on the front end, each of these rumors, we're not saying they're true. We'll weigh in after each one of them to get our thoughts if, if we think one thing or another. But just know on the surface, not saying that all of these things are true, I would almost certainly say that at least some of them are not. And, uh, but I think each of these are sort of interesting. And some of these, I think most people who have explored Mormonism are not going to be aware of. So I'll take the first one here and then I'll have you read the second one. But Josiah Stoll's daughters, Joseph Smith Jr., was arrested on a warrant for several charges on 30 June 1830. Now, this is after the 1826 uh, Bainbridge trial with Josiah Stoll uh, being a witness. Uh, there, if you remember that episode, there were a couple of cases that uh, Joseph Smith was part of in terms of being uh, regards to Bainbridge. Uh, but but this is not the 1826. This is 30 June 1830. The following day, a court trial was held before Judge Joseph Chamberlain at Bainbridge, New York. Twelve witnesses were called, including Miriam and Rhoda Stoll, daughters of Josiah Stoll of Bainbridge. Smith and Mr. Stoll had worked together searching for a silver mine. From October 1825 to March 1826. Folks, if this is all new to you, you'll want to check out the 1826 glass looking trial um, episode that we did on Mormonism Live. I, we show all the documents. We're very thorough there in the research. During this five month period, Joseph frequently associated with the Stoll girls who were 18 and 20 years of age. Do you want me to read? Do you want me to take this entire one and then you just take the next story? 
Totally up to you. Your show, Mr. Real. The prosecutor seeking to determine the character and conduct, a.k.a. sexual behavior, of Joseph Smith called them as witnesses, either because of rumors brought to his attention regarding Joseph and the girls or because he was simply fishing to find something against his character. Both girls were severely examined, particularly as to my, because this is Joseph Smith's words, Joseph Smith's behavior towards them, both in public and in private. Apparently, nothing came of these sexual allegations or accusations. One small comment here. Uh, the word they're using there is severally, which is a lawyer term for both of them. Okay. And essentially, whatever happens, they say nothing about Joseph having done something wrong. It seems like, at least on this particular instance, in regards to their testimony, uh, he comes away uh, not having been thought of to having done anything. But Josiah Stoll's daughters, had you ever heard that he was a that there was at least some uh, evidence in regards to this trial that the that Stoll's daughters were being examined uh, for whatever interactions they had had with the Prophet Joseph Smith? No, I don't recall that. By the way, I should say instead of both, it's each. But it's basically the same thing when you're talking about two people. Enough of the law, right? Um, so there's that one. Okay, Eliza Winters. This was sort of an interesting one. I'll let you have this one, Mr. Radio Free Mormon. Eliza Winters. Is this like the great-great-grandmother of Shelly Winters? Yeah, it's definitely not Shelly Duvall, but I don't know who Shelly Winters is. So well, that's, a, that's a Rebecca. That's a shout-out for Rebecca. That's an inside joke there. That's now outside. Eliza Winters. The prosecutor may have called the Stowell girls as witnesses in the 1830 trial because of earlier sexual accusations made against Smith in nearby Harmony, Pennsylvania. When Joseph and his wife, Emma Hale Smith, were living in Harmony in 1828 to 1829, Emma's cousin, Levi Lewis, accused Joseph of attempting, quote, to seduce Eliza Winters, unquote, Emma's close friend. And then it says in brackets, incorrect, Levi Lewis quoted Harris allegedly saying Joseph tried to seduce Winters, what does that mean, Mr. Real? Yeah, I think this is perhaps Martin Harris, but it's Levi Lewis. Instead of him making the accusation, he's quoting, uh, and I'll let Dan Vogel pipe in, uh, quoting uh, Harris allegedly saying that Joseph tried to seduce Winters. But I was trying to find information online, and Eliza Winters was a friend of Emma Hale. Um, there's not a whole ton of information. I couldn't find a lot of data on her. Uh, all we really have is sort of this one statement, but there's at least on some level um, rumor getting around, again, 1828 to 1829, that Joseph is trying to form some sort of intimate connection with Emma's, uh, with Emma's friend, Eliza Winters. And you've hmm. never heard of this one either? No, uh, I haven't actually. You know, the stuff about Mormonism that I don't know could fill oceans. Oh, sure. Mormonism is uh, such a complicated and broad and deep subject that it's almost coming to the point where you have to be a specialist, even on subjects within Mormonism, to know a lot about it. Uh, I know a lot, but I certainly do not know everything. And that's part of the fun, is learning more and more. Yeah. Um, and Vogel just mentions here, yes, it's in my first biography of Joseph Smith. So he's got a note of, of this story as well. All right. And, uh, oh, here, I'll let you, I'll let you keep reading. There's a couple more slides for this story. Oh, thank you. Lewis, Levi. Levi Lewis further said that he was well acquainted with Joseph Smith Jr. and Martin Harris, and that he has heard them both say that adultery was no crime. Harris said he did not blame Smith for his attempt to seduce Eliza Winters. Elizabeth or Eliza Winter. Is this Winters? Yeah, I, I believe it's Winters, but for whatever reason, the S is missing there. This, okay. by the way, this is all copy and paste of uh, either either documentation or synopsis of each of these events from those who have covered this history. Um, I didn't write any of this. This is just copy and paste from uh, various websites that were going into the details of each of these events. Okay, so. Elizabeth or Eliza Winters was born in 1812, making her 16 years old at the time in 1828 to 29, probably. She was often at Smith's home and much in Mrs. Smith's company. The 
The young women were on very intimate terms, said Harmony resident Mrs. Stocker. Uh, Joseph and Emma's abrupt May 1829 departure from Harmony may have been precipitated in part by Levi Lewis's accusations that Joseph had acted improperly toward Miss Winters. Fifty years later, Levi's brother, Heil Lewis, repeated the same sexual accusations against Smith in the Amboy, Illinois Journal. Yeah. And you mentioned something in our phone call prepping for this show a little bit, just as you had gotten back into town. And you made mention of something which at least offers, I think, some level of credibility that we ought to consider these stories seriously. Do you remember what that was? Yes. Well, you had mentioned that you were going to be going into these stories dealing with pre-1835 accusations of sexual impropriety against Joseph Smith. And of course, a lot of times you got to be very careful about things being said much later after the fact and said that this happened way back when, right? But we know that in the 1835 issue edition of the Doctrine and Covenant, section 101, it states that there had already been accusations that had been leveled against the church of polygamy. And so if they're responding to these accusations, of course, they're denying it and say, no, 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 don't look at us. We're not practicing polygamy. Um, somebody had to be saying it before 1835. And if it's not one of these stories or all of these stories, then it had to be something else because it's in black and white in section 101 of the first edition of the Doctrine and Covenants published in 1835. So there has to be something, some basis for that. Yeah, and I, I want to at least note uh, Dan uh, Vogel's just making mention that Brian Hales disputes all of these. Again, all these meaning the ones we've gone through so far. I'd be curious, Dan, what your personal two cents uh, is on each of these stories, if you see any merit to any of them. Um, because I think Brian Hales might be shaded one direction, at least a little more than I would uh, maybe at times look at the evidence. Uh, but I, so I'd be curious what you would think. And then also, as we get further into these, um, if you want to note whether Brian Hales disputes the rest of them that follow, that would be interesting, I think, to the audience uh, as well. All right. Um, Maven, do you want to read one of these? Hello. Can you hear me yeah. okay? Yep. Okay. You, you had mentioned that this was one that we had covered in the 1826 Glass Looker trial. Yes. Glass, sorry, the tar and feathering of Joseph Smith. My bad. Uh, an that episode one. that we had done a few years ago, and uh, it is, um, but I wanted to include all of them that they had put into the document about the uh, rumors prior to 1835. Okay. Similar sexual allegations were made against Joseph Smith Jr. in Hiram, Ohio at the John Johnson home on 24th of March, 1832. Joseph and Emma were living with the Johnson family at the time. Eli Johnson was more specific. He was troubled because Smith and Rigdon were urging his brother, John Johnson, to, quote, let them have his property, unquote, and was, quote, furious because he suspected Joseph of being intimate with his sister. Um, and then it says, actually, she was his 16-year-old niece, Nancy Miranda Johnson, and he was screaming for Joseph's castration. Unsolicited sexual behaviors may have been the more urgent reason. The attack took place in the middle of the night, suggesting a crime that would arouse immediate action. Procuring the services of Dr. Dennison prior to the attack also suggests a crime of passion may have been committed. Yeah, and I just want to know what Vogels chimed in with. So uh, I just report them, he says, not really deciding their veracity, but when you know what happens later, meaning all of Joseph Smith's polygamy uh, you mentioned, uh, I don't know if it was in the newscast RFM or if it was in the last Mormonism live, but you mentioned that the church and Joseph Smith, for that matter, have this record of just not doing things in an honest, transparent, forthright way. Hence, you start off kind of like Kerry Molstein, you start off with the assumption that the church isn't really worthy of your trust. And hence, you start every conversation not take, not giving them the benefit of the doubt. And with Joseph Smith, it's sort of the same thing. These rumors don't have a ton of data behind them. But when you understand, as Dan says, the life of Joseph Smith, 
it certainly makes it reasonable that he's approaching young women uh, in moments, in rumors like these. It would, let me say it this way, in, in a rumor that happens with Joseph Smith around uh, intimacy with someone outside of his wife, you sort of want to give the benefit of the doubt to it happening and let the data sort of show you that it's unreasonable or or didn't. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. And yet with this I particular report, we looked at the evidence in that prior episode. We looked at all the evidence that we could find. Yeah. I think Dan Vogel was nice enough to say we were pretty thorough in finding out and mentioning the different sources. And we came up with basically, you know, there's not enough evidence here to say no. that this happened one way no. or the other. In fact, it kind of looked like it probably didn't happen. So that gets to that comment that you had uh, mentioned that I had made. I just wanted did, to jump in. Yeah, oh, sorry. No, good. I, I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, no, I just wanted to say that I think, I mean, with this one, I don't think Nancy yeah. herself ever made um, a statement or an accusation this way, whereas with other reports, we do have uh, direct accusations from the women. But I did want to say that um, it's it, it reminds me of when I did the uh, child abuse marathon, uh, just the the number of serial abusers who were able to just like keep moving around while having allegations everywhere they went this is kind of reminding me of that where it's just like you know for some reason i know like believers want to say that it's just they're, they're picking on joseph it's just you know lying women um and we even uh i think we'll get to some quotes like that in this but yeah i just i not every man has sexual allegations every single stop along the way like everywhere he's ever lived, like Joseph Smith does. And like I said, a lot he of does. these serial abusers that were like eventually caught and eventually convicted, but a lot of times off of maybe one or two cases when uh, sometimes they had uh, dozens. And so anyway, that's just what's kind of coming to my mind as we're going through these. And, and as you guys pointed out, we concluded that there were other reasons in the historical documentary history that showed that there uh, that this wasn't really the reason that was being given at the time that the tar and feathering of Joseph Smith occurred. But I will say it is interesting, by the way, that Nancy Miranda Hyde does become later on a plural wife of Joseph Smith. So right. I think that goes into the bucket of evidence that it is the case. I mean, you, to have a rumor about you being inappropriate only to have you have that woman, that female be your plural wife years later. That's sort of a strange coincidence as well. So you're saying there could have been some impropriety, but that's just it's not the reason why the tar and feathering happened, that like two different events kind of got conflated. I'm only gonna say saying? no, no, no. I'm saying that no. based on that episode, I the if we're gonna go off just the evidence, I don't think there was anywhere near enough evidence to say that Nancy Miranda Hyde was approached inappropriately and that led to the tar and feathering. What I am saying though is Yet. that yes, Sorry. but but I am saying that it is a strange coincidence that the very person that is mentioned in that story is Joseph approaching turns into a plural wife of Joseph Smith years later. Well, the odds right. are what one in 33. <laughs> well, it, well, well it depends how many females are in, not, in the area, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think just I just want to point out the fact that that we're able to look at this one and say, we like, you know, based on the evidence, this one might not be real, real doesn't first of all doesn't mean that all of the other accusations aren't real and it also goes to show that we're not just wanting to believe every accusation against joseph without merit and so um yeah so i i feel like this is an important story to include in here for those reasons yeah i think so too and when we're dealing with this statement in uh the 1835 edition of the doctrine and covenants that is responding to apparently multiple allegations of polygamy and fornication being practiced by unnamed Mormons in the church, right? Um, and I only say unnamed Mormons because they're not named in section 101. If that had happened, and if Joseph Smith had lived a celibate, not celibate, but at least monogamous life after that, and if polygamy were not inextricably linked with Mormonism, including with Joseph Smith, such that most people, when you hear the word Mormon, they think plural marriage, right? Number one thing that people associate with Mormonism. 
because of that, you have to look, I have to look at the 1835 denial of practicing polygamy differently than I would if Mormonism had never had anything to do with polygamy. In other words, it makes it look like it's a, there's more to the accusations than there would be otherwise. Yeah, and it, it totally agree. The fact that Joseph Smith is a, a, um, a polygamist who's doing polygamy on a grand scale because the church fights so hard to make polygamy so important to its theology, that adds credibility to the earlier accusations, even if it is lacking evidence. Not that we would throw down the gauntlet and say it absolutely happened, but rather it probably deserves a little more consideration than had those things not happened. Right. In other words, is it a situation where all these stories are made up, so they deny it in 1835, um, and then they think, wow, those stories sound like a good idea. Let's go ahead and start practicing it and making it part of our theology. Yeah. That seems unlikely. It also seems like what would be most rational is if you're gonna if you're gonna be accused of things, and then you're going to create a section in the Doctrine of Covenants where you deny it, that you would really work hard to make sure that you don't do anything that even approaches such behavior going forward. And what Joseph Smith and the church do, do is the exact opposite. Right. And of course, we both know and have covered the fact that uh, John Taylor, who had become the third president of the church, was over in France debating with some ministers who accused him of practicing polygamy, accused the LDS church of practicing polygamy. And John Taylor, who was a practicing polygamist at the time, denied it and said it was a horrible accusation and all that he could do was quote section 101 from the Doctrine and Covenants in putting down that uh, unfounded accusation. And he was using section 101 to lie his way out of the polygamy accusation. Was he the first one? Did that idea occur to him first? Or maybe somebody else had that idea before him? I don't know. Those vicious, unfounded rumors, John Taylor. Ugh. <laughs> and by the way, inner voice. Yeah, and it. By the way, it should be obvious to the audience. I just want to note it. The re. I, I got. I'm just putting two and two together here as we're talking. Um, you note that section 101 is 1835, correct? And the article that I got all this data from was uh, rumors of sexual impropriety prior to 1835. It seems like the author of that article, though it wasn't blatantly said, was connecting the dots and saying the rumor is already out there, just like you pointed out. I'm going to present whatever the most, the, the cases with the most merit to them for what it would have been that might have initiated those rumors that Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith felt like he had to um, address it and, and put it into the public record. So anyway, all right. Um, I want to say here, and Dan, I would really love your two cents on this one as well. I was talking to you RFM before the show, Fanny Elger uh, has her own story. And there are multiple references to a Miss Hill in Kirtland. And all the historians, and myself included, up until this moment, um, have always combined Mrs. Hill with Fanny Alger, that the data was so overlapping that it seemed apparent that while they were naming, in a couple of instances, naming the person as Miss Hill, that what they were actually pointing to was Fanny Alger. And so I'm going to, I'm just telling the audience that it's highly likely that Miss Hill and Fanny Alger are the one in the same, but for the purposes of this, because the article separated them, I did too. And we can at least consider the merit of both sort of separately. So Miss Hill, rumors about Joseph Smith's sexual behavior multiplied in Kirtland, Ohio from 1832 to 1835. Benjamin F. Winchester, a close friend of the prophet, said the Kirtland accusations of scandal and, uh, and I don't know how to pronounce that word. Licentious. Licentious conduct against Smith was discussed, especially among the women. Joseph's name was connected with scandalous relations with two or three families. Martin Harris, in recalling a second incident from the early Kirtland period, said in about the year 1833, Joseph's servant girl, a Miss Hill, claimed that the prophet had made improper proposals to her which created quite the talk among, sorry, quite the talk amongst the people. 
When Smith came to him for advice, Harris, supposing that there was nothing to the story, told him to take no notice of the girl, that she was full of the devil and wanted to destroy the prophet of God. But according to Harris, Smith acknowledged that there was more truth than poetry in what the girl said. Harris then said that he would have nothing to do in the matter and that Smith would have to get out of the matter the best way he knew how. I just want to point out another pattern here, which is just the the tendency to instantly assume upon hearing the story that the girl is totally lying and just wants to just just take a good man down. Like that's immediately where he went. That still happens. That's still like that happened with Tim Ballard. That was still the immediate immediate response and still is in families and neighborhoods when accusations like this are made. It's just that I don't know. There's just something about we want to immediately come to the aid of the person being accused. And, you know, he immediately gets corrected. Then he's like, yeah, I'm out. Right. But the first thing is his first like, initial response was like, yep, she's a lying whore. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. And again, in light of Joseph Smith's life and all the women that he has approached, including 12 year olds, such as uh, Mary Elizabeth Rawlings Leitner, uh, 14 year olds in the case of uh, Helen Mark Kimball. And then is it Nancy Winchester? I think might be the other 14 year old. 15-year-olds in Lucy Walker, 16-year-olds in one of the Partridge sisters, you know, 17 and 18-year-olds are a plenty. It seems as though, uh, for instance, if a woman accuses going forward Bill Cosby of having done something, chances are we probably ought to take her claim at least seriously on the forefront uh, and and look at it that way uh, because Bill Cosby's a serial sexual assaulter. Joseph Smith, to some degree, demonstrates some of those same behaviors. Again, in this country, everybody is innocent until proven guilty, but there's a hell of a lot of smoke, and you don't, you shouldn't get to just say, well, those 34 houses are on fire, but those four or five, uh, that's just a false alarm. Any thoughts here on Miss Hill? No, I'm, I hadn't even heard about there being a Miss Hill. Okay. William McClellan, a former apostle, relates the details of this incident, including how Joseph resolved the matter with Emma, writing their oldest uh, and said, your mother, if she feels disposed, can give you a rather black catalog of events, reaching back as far as your birth, 1832. McClellan began with the Miss Hill incident. I visited your mother and the family in 1847, August 28th, and held a lengthy conversation with her, retired in the mansion house in Nauvoo. I did not ask her to tell, but I told her some stories I had heard, and she told me I was properly informed. Whether I was. Oh, sorry. Uh, whether I was properly informed. Yeah. Thank you. So that makes hopefully, it make I hope it makes it more clear than that. Dr. Frederick G. Williams, a member of the First Presidency of the Church during the Miss Hill incident, practiced medicine with me in Clay County, Missouri, during the latter part of 1838, and he told me that at your birth, 6 November 1832, your father committed an act with a Miss Hill, a hired girl. Emma saw him and spoke to him. He desisted, but Mrs. Smith refused to be satisfied. He called in Dr. Williams and others to reconcile Emma, but she told them just as the circumstances took place. He found he was caught. He confessed humbly. He begged forgiveness. Emma and uh, all forgave him. She told me the story was true. So, uh, and again, this very well may be Fanny Elger as well, um, but at least in name, Miss Hill is named specifically in at least two, maybe three of the early documentation, the early documents of the church. I don't want to say of the church, but documents around that time pertaining to the church. And Fanny Alger is named essentially happening around the same time. Again, most historians have sort of felt like this was all the same story, but I just want to note Hill and Alger are two very different last names. I think it's at least possible that there is a Miss Hill that sort of doesn't really exist in the in the historical documentation, but did live in the area. Um, and I'll leave it up to scholars and historians to sort of sort that out. But up till present date, Miss Hill and Fanny Elger have always been combined, and I would love to know why that is. So there's that. And here we get to actual Fanny Elger. Do you want to read this one, RFM? Sure thing. A third. 
Kirtland incident occurred in 1835 with 19 year old Fanny Ward Alger, one of 10 children born to church members Samuel and Clar Clarissa Alger or Alger. Continuing, there, there's a, a town that I know of, which is not that far away actually, called Alger. So mm -hmm. I go for Alger every time. Uh, continuing his narrative of events to Joseph H.I. Do you know who that is? Uh, that's, no, I don't. I don't know what that is. Okay. Continuing right. his narrative of events to Joseph. I'll bet that's supposed to be the third. Oh, I bet it is. Okay. Either that or he lives in Hawaii. No, no, I think it is the Joseph the third. Okay. Uh, McClellan said, again, I told her, i.e. Emma, again, I told Emma, I heard that one night she missed Joseph and Fanny Alger. She went to the barn and saw him and Fanny in the barn together alone. She looked through a crack and saw the transaction. She told me this story too was true. So this is, um, who is this? Which apostle was this again telling the story? Well, this I think is McClellan. McClellan telling the story to yeah, Joseph William Smith III about a discussion he had with his mother regarding Fanny Alger and Joseph Smith in the barn and the transaction. Mm -hmm. Right. Associate President Oliver Cowdery said that he learned of this incident from Joseph Smith and that Joseph had confided to him that he had confessed to Emma seeking her forgiveness. Fanny Alger and her family left Kirtland in September 1836 and moved to Dublin, Indiana, where she married non-Mormon Solomon Custer shortly after on November 16, 1836. Let's see if there's another one here after that. And this is the next slide. Joseph Smith never saw Fanny Alger again. Cowdery was probably the first to openly talk about the Alger affair. In November 1837, he insinuated that Joseph Smith Jr. was guilty of adultery in a conversation with George W. Harris and again with Apostle David W. Patton. In a letter to his brother, Warren Cowdery, on January 21st, 1838, Oliver was more blunt. He referred to Smith's deed as a dirty, nasty, filthy affair of his and Fanny Alger's. On April 12, 1838, Oliver was excommunicated with nine charges listed, the second being for seeking to destroy the character of President Joseph Smith Jr. by falsely insinuating that he was guilty of adultery. During an 18-month period from 1841 to 1843, documentary evidence reveals that Joseph Smith married 33 plural wives. 11 were single girls, ages 13 to 19. Another 11 were single women over age 19, and 11 were married women yeah yes no, no no just go ahead and continue one mormon scholar has claimed that fanny alger was joseph's first polygamous wife however to make the case compelling the following observations need to be addressed there is no marriage license or record of the ordinance there is no revelation authorizing polygamous marriages until 1840 Joseph Smith may have talked about polygamy in Kirtland, but there is no evidence that he practiced it until 1841 in Nauvoo, Illinois. Joseph Smith did not claim the power to bind on earth and seal in the heavens eternally until Elijah appeared to himself and Oliver Cowdery in the Kirtland Temple on 3rd April 1836. Maybe that happened. Uh, perhaps sometime after the Alger incident, Fanny left the state and quickly rejected counsel by marrying a non-Mormon, something one would not expect from a Mormon plural wife. And yet, whether it's Fanny Alger or not, we have in the 1835 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants a statement that there are apparently multiple allegations against the church of practicing polygamy, even as of that time. Yeah, so definitely the rumors are abound. Okay, and then, then is this is the next slide. Yes, sir. Sometimes a spouse's intuition tells them if their partner has been sexually unfaithful. Emma Smith said that with Joseph, she knew. William McClellan later recorded in his notebook his extended conversation with Emma Smith on August 28, 1847. Mrs. Joseph Smith, the widow of the prophet, told me in 1847 that she knew 
her husband. The prophet practiced both adultery and polygamy. Well, okay, she would she would more than just know. I mean, wasn't she completely involved, at least according to some historical accounts, with his marriage to the Partridge sisters at a minimum? At least at some point, perhaps after the actual initial religious sealing was done, right? Yeah. But in other words, it's more than just intuition. Right. Um, okay. Sexual allegations involving Eliza Winters, Nancy Miranda Johnson, Ms. Hill, Fanny Alger, and perhaps Miriam and Rhoda Stowell were made against the character of Joseph Smith from 1829 to 1835. As a married man, Joseph Smith must have been mortified to be accused of improper sexual conduct with at least four young women during the six-year period. Each reader can evaluate these allegations for themselves. Yeah. Um, it, it, it is, I just, I, I can't help but note that, again, over the course of Joseph Smith's life, that he seems to have a propensity for securing young women into the home, uh, approaching them with some sort of request for an intimate relationship. Um, in the case of Lucy Walker, you know, he sends, she, he sends dad on a mission. Um, there's other, you know, stories where Joseph Smith sends the husbands on missions. Uh, Orson Hyde, I think, is the the one that's prominent. And the only one I think I know of. But at least in Lucy Walker's instance. Is that maybe sends, Orson Pratt? No, no, Orson Hyde, who went to bless Jerusalem. And it was. Uh, yeah. It, I'm just, isn't it? I'm, I'm trying to think offhand. I think it's the Hyde who goes to Jerusalem, yeah. and, Jerusalem and blesses that, that Joseph ends up approaching uh, his wife while he's gone. Okay. I think both Orsons had a problem there. Yeah, well, Joseph had a problem. <laughs> um, but you have, you know, the, the Lawrence sisters, the Partridge sisters, Fanny Alger, Lucy Walker, at a minimum, are put into close proximity to Joseph. He takes them into the home. There's just, again, I know the apologists defend Joseph Smith to the end, but when I look at Joseph Smith, I see somebody who clearly demonstrates predatory behavior, who grooms uh, underage females in order to get some sort of intimate relationship with them. And uh, I sort of struggle when I hear the story of Fanny Alger, I sort of, and Lucy Walker and the others, I, I struggle with why it's so difficult. And again, I know, I understand that, you know, they throw, they throw their opinion the other direction on this, then maybe the entire uh, Lego set falls down and collapses to the ground. Right. But it just seems like Joseph Smith has over and over and over again females under the age of 18 or barely at it, takes them into the home, manipulates them into some sort of relationship, gives them short time frames to make decisions, tells them that their salvation's at stake. And you see that pattern play out over and over and over again. And as Maven pointed out, anytime somebody says something, uh, the woman or underage female is. Uh, criticized and belittled and knocked down as if she's the problem. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, there's that. Okay. And then uh, Martin Harris and a Mrs. Haggard. Now this was, now we're getting to the last two stories. Um, these, this one was sort of new. I learned this one maybe a few months back. And then the next story involves Brigham Young. And I found that story just be fascinating. And I think it's the one where I see the most merit to, uh, to the evidence. But prior to 1829, Lucy Harris, Martin's wife, said of her husband's behavior with a Mrs. Haggard, quote, at, a, at different times while I lived with him, he was whipped, kicked. I'm sorry. At different times while I lived with him, he has whipped, kicked, and turned me out of the house. So, so Martin Harris physically abused uh, Miss Lucy Harris. And with regard to Miss Mr. Harris being intimate with Mrs. Haggard, as has been reported, it is but justice to myself, oh, state what facts come within my own observation. I'll bet that's supposed to be two. Yeah, probably myself to state what facts come within my own observation to show whether I had grounds for jealousy or not. Mr. Harris was very intimate with his family, with this family. For some time previous to their going to Ohio, they lived a while. Again, this is her words, so maybe, however they spelled it, and, and maybe it's the person who did the the write up. They just didn't do a very good job editing. 
uh, they lived a while in a house which he had built for their accommodation. And here he spent most of his leisure hours and made her presence of articles from the store and the house. He would steer a straight course for Haggard's, especially if Haggard was from home. I think it's Mr. Haggard was far, was from home. At times, when Haggard was from house, he would go there in the manner above described and stay till 12 or 1 o'clock at night and sometimes until daylight. Joseph Smith's New York Reputation examined Roger Anderson, page 132 to 134. But these are supposed to be the words of Mrs. Harris, Lucy Harris. And if 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 she really did say these things, it seems as though Martin's wife pretty clearly thought that he was uh, doing some funny business at the neighbor's house. So there's that one. And then, uh, and then our last, uh, it was just, I'm sorry, let me read this last one here. So in March, 1830, a revelation addressed to Martin Harris warned him, I command thee that thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor seek thy neighbor's life. DNC 1925. Ezra Booth, a group companion to Martin Harris, an early member of the church in Missouri in 1831, wrote shortly after his apostasy to Reverend Ira Eddy on 6 December 8, 1831. He said, it has been made known by revelation. And then it says, see Revelation Joseph Smith, July 1831, H. Michael Marcourt, the Joseph Smith Revelations, text and commentary, signature book, Salt Lake City, 1999, page 374 to 376. Um, so he says, uh, wrote shortly after his apostasy to Reverend Ira Eddy on 6 December 1831, that it will be pleasing to the Lord should they, the single elders, form a matrimonial alliance with the natives. And you and I are familiar with this where Martin Harris is sent out to, with sort of permission to marry the Native Americans. And, and by this means, the elders who comply with this thing so pleasing to the Lord and for which the Lord has promised to bless those who do it abundantly. It has been made known to one Harris who has left his wife in the state of New York. Harris was in Missouri that he entirely, that he is entirely free from his wife and he is at pleasure to take him a wife from among the Lamanites. It is easily perceived that this permission was perfectly suited to his desires. I have frequently heard him state that the Lord made it known to him that he is as free from his wife as from any other woman, and the only crime I ever heard alleged against her is she is violently opposed to Mormonism. And that's quoted in uh, Mormonism Unveiled, page 220. So there's that. And then it says, uh, actually, that's a duplicate. So there's that one. Um, had you, and you'd never heard this story either where Martin Harris's wife accuses him of, of cheating on her. You know, I don't think I have, uh, certainly not in the detail that you're giving it now. I've heard, you know, things here and there, and I don't know if this was in the context of her seeking a divorce against him where she had to prove grounds for it and may have served as a basis for these accusations. I don't know. Yeah. And by the way, I'm not, I'm not pointing out to the audience. I'm not pointing out like that you don't know these because you don't, I just think you're way smarter than me in terms of the information you've got on Mormonism. And I always find it interesting when you come up with something that I'd never heard of. And I come up with something you've never heard of. Um, it, it, it doesn't happen a lot, but when it happens, I think it's, it's interesting that one of us caught a story somewhere along the way that the other didn't. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, and then I'll let you read this last story. This is the one I thought was the most interesting. And I think you'll see why as we get into the details. So, Augusta Adams, this is a woman, Augusta. I guess that's the female version of Augustus. Augusta Adams, daughter of John and Mary Ives Adams, was born December 7th, 1802 in Beverly, Essex, Massachusetts. She married Henry Cobb, December 22nd, 1822 in Charlestown, Worcester, Massachusetts, and together they had seven children. She was baptized a Mormon by Samuel H. Smith, first missionary for the church near Boston on June 29, 1832. In 1842, Brigham Young was on a mission in the Boston area and met Augusta. They fell in love, and she abandoned her husband and all but the two youngest children and moved to Nauvoo, Illinois. She became pregnant during the time Brigham was in town, and when that child was born, she named him George Brigham Cobb, who was born May 17, 1843. 
Oh, extracts from the deposition of Henry and Augusta's divorce proceedings. Yeah, divorce proceedings. In the fall of 1844, after her return from Nauvoo to Boston, Mrs. Cobb said she loved Brigham Young better than she did Mr. Cobb and live or die, she was going to live with him at all hazards. This was in the course of a conversation in which she used extravagant language in favor of Mr. Young and against Mr. Cobb. Mrs. Cobb went out again to Nauvoo the second time and lived with Mr. Young and their living together and their conduct was the subject of conversation in the society and out of the society. The subject of conversation to which I have alluded was that persons had a right to live together in unlawful intercourse and Mrs. Cobb avowed her belief in this doctrine and said it was right. In conversation, do you know who's writing this? I I don't. Uh, I just know that the actual documentation of the divorce decree still is out there, mm-hmm. um, and I know this is tied to the divorce. So I don't, but I don't know what the actual source is. Okay. In conversation with Mrs. Cobb on the subject of spiritual wives, I told her such doctrines would lead to the devil. And she said if it did, she would go there with Brigham Young. The Mormons were so incensed with me for my opposition to this doctrine that they attempted to take my life in various ways. This would be one, there would be another. (laughs) Various ways. I think Mrs. Cobb was originally a woman of good feelings and good principles, but I do not think so of her now. I think she was led away by religious frenzy. She said, I never will forsake Brother Young, come life or come death. She said that the doctrine taught by Brigham Young was a glorious doctrine, for if she did not love her husband, it gave her a man she did love. Yeah. Maybe it's religious frenzy. Maybe she just got it bad for Brigham. Yeah, and I think the most interesting part of the story, you know, Brigham goes to Massachusetts. He's teaching the gospel. He converts Augusta Adams Cobb, who becomes pregnant, coincidentally, while Brigham's there, having taught her the gospel. She falls in love with Brigham, leaves her husband, goes back with Brigham to the saints, marries Brigham Young, names that child that she was pregnant with, names that child, uh, let me go back one more. Brigham Young Cobb. George, yeah, George Brigham Cobb. Oh, George Brigham Cobb, that was it. Who was born 17 May, 1843. Now, one would be left wondering if George Brigham Cobb is the son of Brigham Young or her husband. Uh, And she at least indicates that her relationship with Brigham was pretty romantic pretty quickly. She sounds completely infatuated with the fellow, and he is singing in her ear, Please come to Boston for the springtime. (laughs) Uh, Okay, Uh, of these stories... Which which of these do you think has the most merit? Well, obviously, Fanny Alger is sort of granted by all sides, although the debate is about whether it was a ceiling or a, an affair. But outside of Fanny Alger, and we'll eliminate Miss Hill because it probably is Fanny Alger. What are your thoughts on these other stories? Do you give any of them any merit, do you think? Or are these, uh, are these all just cast aside as uh, vicious, unfounded rumors? I don't know. All I know is that there were enough allegations of fornication and polygamy being made against members of the church in good enough standing for it to get its own section in the Doctrine and Covenants by 1835. And if it's not these, then it must have been some others. Must have been something else then, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So something happened. There's Where there's smoke, there's fire. Or there's, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and of course, I'm not saying that the denial in 1835 was a lie, but I'm saying yeah. they were responding to something, and then they go on to practice polygamy shortly thereafter, if not concurrently with, and so there was probably something to at least some of those allegations. Yeah, Eliza Winters, by the way, we don't really hear of her being a friend of Emma later on in life. Uh, it seems like that friendship sort of came to an end about the time that those rumors uh, occurred, which may or may not be some indication of something, but the ones that I thought were the most interesting, again, if if Martin Harris's wife is saying those things directly about Martin, 
you sort of would take a spouse uh, kind of stronger at their word when they're saying something like that than strangers sort of passing rumors around. And then, you know, Augusta Cobb getting pregnant and then meeting Brigham, falling in love, leaving her husband, running off with Brigham Young, and then names that baby that she was pregnant with after Brigham. That certainly, uh, certainly doesn't sound too good, does it? <laughs> no. And, uh, my understanding then from the timeline, that was around 1842, right? Let's see. The uh, baby was born May of 1843. 43, yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So he's out there in 1842. That would have been completely along the timeline, I think, um, of Joseph Smith's introduction of polygamy and adopting Brigham Young into it. Although, of course, there are some others out there who look at Brigham Young as the villain who is doing all of this behind Joseph Smith's back. Yeah, I and I think by the way, George Brigham Cobb died pretty quickly after being born. He didn't live to adulthood. And hence there isn't going to be some adult photo of the child that we could sort of say, does that look like Brigham Young or not? That would have made this story a lot more interesting mm. if we could have thrown a, an adult picture of George Brigham Cobb up on the page and he looked like uh, one of Brigham's kids. But um but suffice it to say, I think it's at least an interesting story. As you can tell, folks, all of these things before 1835 don't have a significant amount of evidence outside of perhaps Fanny Alger, and uh, the rest of them are sort of a little more sketchy, but some of them have some details that I think are at least interesting. Uh, phone lines are open, folks, 662-667-6667 or 662-MORMONS, and I'll just say, RFM, is there any other thoughts you've got or Maven, if you've got about some of this early stuff, I, I like your idea, RFM, that if 101 is out there, something's going on. And if it's not one of these five or six stories, then uh, it's got to be some other story. Um, so I, anyway, I have something kind of off topic. So RFM, if you have something on topic, I'll invite you to go first. Please go ahead. Okay. I just want to share this real quick. I've just been trying to do this for the Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention Month, and I feel like this is a good episode to do it on because, again, there's a lot of overlap with what's still happening today. I know a lot of members of the church um, have found help through this. This is uh, this is through RAIN. This is the Rape, Abuse, and Incest Nat National Network. They're the ones that the um, that have the U.S. national hotline. Um, it's, I think, 1-800-856. No, I got I to gotta look. Yeah, 1-800-656-HOPE. So if there's anyone you know uh, that needs it or if you want to learn more about this or how to help or just how to be more aware of things like this, um, it's a great website to go to. Um, they also have a live chat. And I've been trying to do a little fundraiser for them, I'm trying to raise $200 and also walk a mile for each day in April. Um, I started it on April 9th, so I'm a little bit behind, but I'm, I'm catching up. So I'll go ahead and put a link in the chat if you guys are... Um, if you guys are willing, um, of course, we always love donations at Mormon discussions as well. But that's that's yeah. it. That's my yeah. plug. Yeah, I, I think it yeah. obviously deeply connected to the topic that we're covering, Maven. And uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. And it's right. it's anonymous, so yeah. So if people, it, you know, nothing has to really be done, or you know, if you just need to talk and you just want to work it out and it's not safe for you to leave where you're at or, or whatever. It's a very, very safe understanding place. And you said and you, you would post, as I say, you would post the link. Yeah. Link. Yeah. It's perfect. Awesome. Okay. Let's, uh, let's go to the phone lines. Let's see if they work. They didn't work last week, by the way, RFM. So we'll see if they're working this time. Uh, I believe we've got a Randy on the line. Randy, are you there? I am Bill. Can you hear me? I can, my friend. Hey, well, thank you. I've been listening to you guys for years, and it's the first time I've ever called. But, you know, I've gone rounds and rounds with apologetics, especially uh, Brian Hale, and more recently, listening to Don Bradley on a bunch of these uh, apologetic YouTube uh, discussions. It just drives me crazy, and I can never get them to have a conversation, the big elephant in the room, when it comes to Joseph Smith's polygamy, and that is fidelity. They all want, they want to talk about him marrying pregnant women who, you know, can't have kids. And, and back then they didn't want to have sex with pregnant women. All these weird apologetics about the mechanical things of polygamy, but not the whole idea that 
he's having sex with women or marrying women behind him as back for what, how many tens of dozens of women? Well, I don't know what Emma was, 20 something wife field that Joseph. I just want, I want the conversation to revolve around the whole, the fidelity of it. How is that marital fidelity and what kind of a God would, would want to foster that? Yeah. Um, even in the instances where Emma knows things are going on, she seems to be the last person in the room to know that the things are going on. Um, and often it, it seems as though she's kept entirely in the dark until somehow she learns of it by her own effort and then sort of brought into the loop on that particular person. But then Joseph, a few weeks later, does it again and leaves her out of the loop once again. And and he does the same thing with the wives. I mean, just the Partridge sisters alone, neither of them knew about the other one. Um, and so even as he's carrying out whatever this is, and he's, you know, the historical record, I think, shows that he approached several of these women and told them that they were the first that he would enter into this new doctrine of plural marriage with, when in reality, only one person could be the first plural wife. It seems like a way to boost people up and make them feel special. All of the things he did yeah. seem to have the the makings of what a predator or an abuser does to groom people to uh, to sort of lean into what he's asking of them rather than to be appalled and run away. Yeah, you know, I I had a two separate conversations with a a general authority as I tried to get my ceiling canceled to my ex wife who, you know, committed adultery, abused our children. I got custody. It was a mess. Nonetheless, I, I could not get the church to cancel my feeling to her so I could be sealed to my current wife I've been sealed with for 15 years. We're no longer uh, active and haven't been for years now. But as I talked to this general authority, I brought this up. I said, okay, you know, his response to me when I said, he said, don't worry about that. You know, God's not going to make you stay sealed to this woman in the life you're after. I said, but why is the church then? And where is this faith? Where's the fidelity in it? I mean, I want nothing to do with this other woman. And the fact that I'm sealed to two living women, where's the fidelity in it? And he couldn't give me an answer. He said, yeah, just don't call her name forward in the, in the, in the resurrection, you know, at the veil. Just don't call her name forward. <laughs> just weird stuff. And it was, it was this very thing about polygamy and fidelity that really was my, was my uh, ticket out. Are you familiar, Randy, with the, the story of Lucy Walker? Um, you know, I listen to Lindsay Hanson Park every single episode. So they, all these ladies' names run together. Help me out. Well, Lucy Walker, she's, uh, I think, 15 years old. Her mother dies. Uh, oh. Joseph Smith approaches the father who's just in turmoil after he's lost his wife. And says, the best thing for you is to get you out of here. And he sends them on a mission. Says, I'll take the oldest four kids into my home. And I find it really strange that Lucy Walker happens to be the youngest of the oldest four. In other words, she is the cutoff. Her and the older three siblings move into the Smith home. Smith walks out into public with uh, Lucy and her sister and says, these are my daughters. He, he is essentially announced to the world that he is taking care of them as his, as their essentially foster father. And then uh, when she turns 16, Joseph Smith approaches her to enter a polygamous relationship, to be a plural wife of Joseph Smith. And I, I, first off, I can't make any sense of a God who, while his prophet is in a father-daughter relationship with a female living in the home for God to go, you know what I think I'm going to do? I'm going to ask Joseph to change that father daughter relationship into one of a husband and wife. That seems so immoral of a, of a father in heaven to do. And, uh, but Joseph goes so much further. He, he gives her 24 hours to decide. He tells her that if she doesn't agree that the gates of heaven will be closed against her, she comes back, not able to decide. She, he gives her 24 more hours. She says she was unable to sleep. So now she's almost certainly gone two nights and two days with no sleep. She's been told that her family's salvation rides on her saying yes. 
And uh, the prophet has told her all of this spiritual language about how bad it is if you say no and how good it is if you say yes. And then she has a spiritual experience. But we all sort of grasp and science says that you give somebody enough sleep deprivation and you put enough stress on them, which in both instances, she was clearly experiencing both. Then there's no doubt she would have a spiritual experience. And she did. And what, But what other choice did she have? Did she really have a choice to come back and say no? She didn't. And uh, so when you talk about fidelity to Emma, fidelity to you know any of the parties involved, it's not just fidelity. It's, it's that the way in which he enacted these relationships, it just looks like a, a child molester. It looks like a predator. And... Uh, and yet no one on the believing side ever wants to have that conversation, just like they don't want to have the conversation with you on fidelity. All right. Man, your perspective is great. Yeah. Thank you for your time. I appreciate Thank all you guys are doing. Thank you, Randy. Have a great day. Thanks, Randy. Bye. Thanks very Bye. much. Bye. Of course, there's uh, Brian Hales who um, argues against, I think, Joseph having had sexual relations with any of the women who were already married to other men in favor of his having sex with the women who were not already married as if he has somehow achieved a victory with that. I think that what ends up happening with people who really get immersed in a subject like this is that they can, you know, they go past all the stuff about the, um, the infidelity and the going behind the back. And certainly they probably experienced that at some point, but now they're down into the details and they're talking about these other things in a very clinical kind of bloodless, historical way. And I think it's very easy when you get to that level to lose track of the fact that you are talking about real flesh and blood people and the fidelity that is not there for Emma can get lost, I think, sometimes in the historical footnotes. Yeah, and just one more note on the Lucy Walker story. By the way, great point. The Lucy Walker herself says, I afterwards married Joseph as a plural wife and lived and cohabitated with him as such. Now, I can't understand that any other way than she had sex with him. Um, you can take it as she only lived with him, but that doesn't make much sense. She married him, and she cohabitated with him as such, as his wife. That's her words. Um, and she's a she's a 16-year-old, maybe 17, but she's a 16-year-old girl. She's an underage female. And we're always debating, well, there's no children. Well, that's all fine and dandy, but if you're a Brighamite Mormon, you have to deal with the fact that immediately following Joseph Smith are, is prophet after prophet after prophet, who is also marrying women with huge age differences, many of them underage, and having children. Hence, while Joseph Smith, you may have a loophole and be able to get around it, you aren't able to get around it with Brigham Young and John Taylor and Lorenzo Snow and Wilford Woodruff. Um. Anyway, and Joseph F. Smith. So some don't of those arguments, the F. yeah, some of those arguments don't work. It, it, and apologists look, yeah, don't forget the they, don't worry, they didn't. <laughs> um, apologists like to stay focused on Joseph Smith, but folks, try to take the conversation to the next four or five. Uh, because the same rules that they go like, well, yeah, but there's no children. Well, the same rules there get broken when you take the next ones. Right. And of course, it's probably stating the obvious, but sometimes it's a good thing to state that is that in Joseph Smith's day in Kirtland and Nauvoo, uh, they couldn't have kids. I mean, if they had kids out of wedlock, then that was going to bring the law down upon them. Yeah. Yeah. And you had John C. Bennett, who even Hiram Smith said had uh, the ability to perform abortions. And uh, I think it's not fair to discount that as absolutely not having happened. And we also reminded folks that prophylactics or condoms existed back then as well. Uh, it's not like it was something that wasn't around. It was around. Yeah, I have not done an extensive in-depth analysis of all of these different women and all the different facts related to them. I would just suggest that it would probably be, at least as far as that goes, safest to have sex with married women. Yeah. Because at least if they have a child, you can blame it somewhere else. Right. Unless it looks just like you. Yeah. Anyway, there's nobody else in the phone bank uh, RFM, so we can uh, we can wrap it up if you're if you're okay. Any final thoughts from you, my friend? 
No, I thought this was a really interesting subject tonight, and it's uh, interesting to go into what are these stories that may have formed the basis for the denial in 1835. Yeah, yeah, no doubt these are the possible reasons why Section 101, the revelation on monogamy, was given. Right, and of course, I think that it's true, and Dan Vogel will correct me, if I'm wrong, that the further back you get in Mormonism, probably it's true for anything, uh, the sparser the historical documents become. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and totally there as well. I mean, there's no, I don't think we're ever going to be able to prove outside of the Elgar uh, event, the other ones that we talked about. I think they'll always be left sort of with just some some mild data that sort of points to something, but we're not going to be able to say for sure what occurred. Uh, but at the very least, as you pointed out, Joseph Smith was a philandering man of one sort or another. He had a roving eye. He did. Okay, folks, have a great night. Please like and subscribe. Uh, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and uh, please consider donating to Mormonism Live. Go to mormonismlive.org. Click the donate button. Send us a few dollars. All we ask is five bucks a month, 10 bucks a month, something to keep us going. And for those who do don donate, uh, we deeply appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you for helping us keep this show going. Uh, I think we're, are we in year three or four? Uh, we're in the fourth year. Yeah. Radio Free Mormon has been running for about eight years. I'm in the eight year, eight year, excuse me. And Mormon discussion has been around for 12. So folks, thank you. It's, it is deeply dependent on you and we appreciate so much your support have a great night everybody and uh, see you at the mormon newscast on monday uh this weekend maybe if rfm's got the bags unpacked and ready to hit the the pavement again uh, brush up your shakespeare and mormon sunday school and otherwise we'll see you guys next week at 6 20 p.m have a great day give brother joseph a break